We're going to go buy it in a couple of minutes, but if you look over there to the right and you can see that motel complex, and you see the building that sort of looks like a, with a little cupola on top of it, the smaller reddish building there. Mm -hmm. If you look just to the left, there's a stone structure. That's the Widow Thompson's house, and that's where Robert E. Lee makes his headquarters when he finally arrives on the battlefield on the afternoon of July 1st. Now, he probably doesn't take up uh, utilizing that building until the night of July 1st, but he will be over there and probably have tents, tents pitched right in the field right in front of where that structure is located. The fellow up there is John Fulton Reynolds, the Union First Corps commander, and this is a monument honoring John Buford, who is looking down the Cashtown Road or the Chambersburg Pike or the Lincoln Highway. Every road in Gettysburg has at least three names <laughs> on it, and that's the route the Confederate forces will march into Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st, bumping into Buford's cavalry, which have been strung out along these ridges right here. On Sunday, June 28th, the Confederate Army has been in Pennsylvania for days, is in a 60-mile arc from your right to my left over here and 30 miles behind us. Some of those Confederate troops will virtually be in sight of the capital of Harrisburg without any real opposition, gathering supplies and materials. Lee will now get information, not by his cavalry, but by a paid informant. And here's your whole beginning of the movie Gettysburg. The paid informant, Henry Harrison, will go through Confederate lines and tell Major or General Longstreet, and who informs General Lee, that two things have happened. The Union Army has swapped commanders and replaced General Hooker with George Gordon Meade from Philadelphia, and they have now crossed the Potomac River, and they're sitting just to the south of us near Frederick, about 35 miles that way. With that information, Lee, who doesn't particularly want to believe this information, has to start acting on it. He gives orders to his commanders now to bring his army together to do battle in preparation for the arrival of Union forces. With, those, with that information and the fact that 10 roads feed into Gettysburg, now we've got the Confederate Army converging on this town from the west, the north, and the northeast, <coughs> Union forces coming up from the south. The two armies now bump into each other on the 30th of June as Buford brings two brigades of cavalry up through Gettysburg looking for Lee's Confederate Army, spots North Carolinians under the command of Johnston Pettigrew on this road. Both sides pull back. Buford will stake out the town of Gettysburg, recognizing its importance from all the roads and the fact that there's some high ground to the south, and, Bu and Pettigrew will pull back to Cashtown and inform his officer or his commanding officers that he has spotted Confederate for or Union forces here in the town of Gettysburg. His boss, a fellow by the name of Henry Heath, gets permission that night on June 30 to bring a division of Confederate troops back into Gettysburg. This is where the Chew story gets started because Henry Heath says he's going to conduct a reconnaissance in force. Now, he's got orders not to bring on a general battle, and he does exactly that. So he's got to justify it somehow. So he said, I had a reconnaissance in force looking for shoes. Well, there probably wasn't much to find in here. What he's probably hoping that he's going to gobble up was a lot of that local Pennsylvania militia, a nice trophy to take back. What he bumps into is the Army of the Potomac, not knowing that. Now, Pettigrew is over there protesting the whole time, saying those troops didn't look like amateur troops over there th today. They look like the Army of the Potomac. And Heath and A.P. Hill are saying, no, 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 that, that, they're, not, they're not across the Potomac yet. Well, they were. So on the morning of July 1st, Buford, who's figured out the situation, has placed cavalry here on McPherson's Ridge, over there where the houses are located, called Hare Ridge. He's going to have some men even a mile or two beyond that on Schoolhouse Ridge and Knoxland Ridge. He's basically constructed a defense in depth from one ridge to the next, and all these ridges run north to south, paralleling each other. He can't hold that a lot of troops out of the town of Gettysburg, but he can buy time. Henry Heath brings 7,500 men into Gettysburg. They bump into Buford's cavalry it's about 7 a.m. A couple of shots get fired, and from that, this escalates into one of the greatest battles fought uh, in the, in, in, well, probably the greatest battle fought on the North American continent, and the greatest battle of the Civil War lasting three days, the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of July. Buford's cavalry is gradually driven from one ridge to the next. As they fall back, they buy more time. Buford is now looking for infantry to help him. He sent word down to Emmitsburg, Maryland, that he needs help. And coming up at a rather leisurely pace will be John Reynolds and the First Corps. They're going to arrive a little bit before 10, just as Buford is being driven back up here under McPherson's Ridge. As they're being pushed back, Reynolds takes command of the field and now sends leading elements of his army initially across the road. Uh, New York and, and Pennsylvania troops, and as the second line swings into position, Meredith's Brigade, known as the Iron Brigade, will be sent through this woodlot to go down here and take on Confederate forces that are now massing up on Hare Ridge. That's will be Archer's Brigade, and now we've got heavy fighting breaking out on the morning of July 1st. So you can imagine that the two battle lines for the next couple of hours are going to move back and forth. In the initial fighting, Iron Brigade mauls Archer's Brigade rather badly. 
takes a number of prisoners and captures James Archer. On the far side of the road, Mississippi and North Carolina troops will manhandle Cutler's Union Brigade over there a little bit uh, more easily and start to drive them back towards the town of Gettysburg uh, until re some reinforcements help stabilize that situation. Over on the far side of the road, we've got a particularly nasty fight over there in a railroad cut as one of the Iron Brigade regiments gets sent over to the aid of the Union troops. So you can imagine there's an ebb and flow all through here. Now, later in the morning, this fight will settle down with the Iron Brigade holding this line as we ride along the Park Road and Archer's Brigade falling back over to Hare Ridge. There's fighting going back and forth, but then later in the afternoon, as Robert E. Lee, Lee, e. Lee arrives on the field, he brings up additional troops, renews the attack <laughs> against this position, and this is where we've got Pettigrew's North Carolina Brigade coming up through this swale and coming up and taking head on the 26th North Carolina, going up against the 24th Michigan in that epic battle of those two units late on the afternoon of July 1st. 26th North Carolina with tremendous numbers of casualties as a result of that fight, but they will dislodge the 24th Michigan and force them to fall back to the east and regroup over in the grounds of the Lutheran Seminary. So that fight, when you think in terms of the 26th North Carolina, which loses ultimately in excess of 600 men in this three-day battle, that fight takes place right along this line here. Archer's Brigade initially, and then Pettigrew's Brigade moving into position behind them later in the day. And then finally, as Archer's or Pettigrew's uh, brigade, or brigade drives out the Iron Brigade, Late in the day, those exhausted troops will literally lay down and a second a line of troops coming from Pender's division will arrive here and move through this woodlot and finally attack the center and drive the Union forces out and force them to fall back into the town of Gettysburg. So there's a lot of fighting out here. This is a monument placed here by the state of North Carolina uh, relatively recently to honor several of its units that saw heavy fighting. This is to the 26th North Carolina. Those troops, even though they take tremendous losses here, what's left of that regiment will be used during Pickett's Charge and literally work their way right up to the angle, and we'll show you where they end up on day three. Just, you know, modern-day Army says if we take more than 10 percent losses, we consider that, that unit combat ineffective and pull them off the line. Now, that's assuming you have enough troops that you can pull people off the line and stick somebody else out there. Civil War units in this battle routinely would take 30, 40, 50 percent losses, killed, wounded, or captured, and be put right back on the line the next day. The uh, first Minnesota, which takes the highest percent losses of any Union unit on this here in the battle, will take close to 80 percent losses, and what's left of that unit will be thrown right back on the line the next day during Pickett's Charge. That's the Lutheran Seminary, and there's your cupola that's pictured prominently right in the beginning of the movie Gettysburg. The building to its left with the steeple is a present modern-day chapel on the grounds of the Lutheran Seminary. This is a railroad cut. The tracks hadn't been laid in 1863, but the cut was here. It becomes an ideal trench or to fight from as Confederate troops out in this field under the command of Joseph C. Davis. A little bit of uh, controversy because Davis is the nephew of Jefferson Davis, so a lot of people think there's a little nepotism going on here that he's gotten this rank of Brigadier General. Archer's Brigade in the early fighting is advancing against the Iron Brigade to the south of us. New York and Pennsylvania troops are now going to engage uh, Johnson's or Davis's brigade coming in from that hair ridge over there to our left in the early fighting. These are going to be Mississippi and North Carolina troops, 55th North Carolina in Davis's brigade. So we got North Carolinians on both sides of this road fighting on day one. These troops and North Carolinians in the early fight, the Pettigrew's men later in the day over there. These Confederates start to sweep up the Union line and push it in towards the town and the seminary. They suddenly discover that railroad cut. Now you remember, or think back, these fields were planted. They, you don't see that railroad cut. So all of a sudden, here's this natural fortification. The railroad cut will be particularly interesting, I think, from a historical point of view. I like to talk about it from the point of the 6th Wisconsin, and that's their monument over there with the reddish granite in it. North Carolinians jump into it, Mississippi troops jump into it, fire into the retreating Yankees, and then all of a sudden somebody remembers they left the regiment over in the grounds of the Lutheran Seminary as a reserve unit from the Iron Brigade, the 6th Wisconsin. 6 Wisconsin gets summons, they come across the fields, fight their way into that railroad cut, enfilades down here against the 11th and 42nd Mississippi and 55th North Carolina that would be down in here. So we got North Carolina troops in the fight for the railroad cut, although they were further on the southern end. It's the Mississippi units that get the, the real brunt of it uh, in that fight. 
and now what has been a nice place to fight from becomes a trap as, as Wisconsin troops can fire down that railroad cut and Union tr and Confederate troops that try and scramble up the steep banks can't get out fast enough and now a couple of New York regiments come to the aid of the 6th Wisconsin and we get a couple of hundred Confederate troops trapped in that railroad cut, end up surrendering, becoming prisoners of war, battle flags get taken.